Yes, it's true. Not only have mathematicians co-opted the exclamation point for their own sick purposes, but they've even co-opted the double exclamation point. In this video, we'll go over what both of these symbols mean in mathematics and give you a little introduction to graph theory so you can see an example of a problem where this second symbol actually shows up. This first symbol, the exclamation point, mathematicians might call it the bang symbol, it is of course the factorial, which is pretty well known. If you haven't seen it before, for an example, 4 factorial is equal to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you take the factorial of a positive integer, and what that equals is just the product of the integer times all the integers less than it, down to 1. Of course, this happens to equal 24. I think people get a real kick out of the factorial when they first see it, because it's really the first time since the period that an English, you know, grammar symbol has been stolen away for mathematics. Now, like I said, we take factorials of positive integers, but you can also take the factorial of zero, which we define to equal one. So zero factorial, that's defined to equal one, and you can look up lots of other videos talking about why that's a good choice if you care to do that. But now let's focus on this, two exclamation points. What the heck does this mean? Well, it's called a double factorial. Now, one possible meaning for this is that it would just be the factorial of the factorial. That would be perhaps the most obvious thing. For example, three double factorial. Well, maybe that means this. It means the factorial of three factorial. We know that three factorial is three times two times one. And so maybe we're just supposed to take the factorial of that, which is six factorial. And of course, we could compute that if we cared to, six times five times four, and so on, down to one. Uh, but it turns out this is actually not how it works. That's not what it equals. If you did want to write this expression, you'd have to write it like this, three factorial, closed in parentheses, with a factorial outside of that. But if you've got two factorials right next to each other, you're no longer talking about factorial, you're talking about the double factorial, also called the alternating factorial. If you're curious, by the way, the notation for the double factorial was introduced in 1902 by a fella who went by the name Arthur Schuster. I think I've spelt that right. But anyways, let's see this great notation that Mr. Schuster introduced and see what it means. All right, let me ask you this. Do you know what parity means? I don't mean evenness of playing field. That's one meaning of parity. I mean evens and odds. The parity of a number is whether it's even or odd. So for example, five of course is odd, whereas a number like two is even. The double factorial is dependent on the parity of the number we're taking the double factorial of. And here's how it works. If I take the double factorial of let's say seven, since seven is odd, the double factorial is going to work just like the normal factorial, except it's only going to use the odd integers in the product. So it's not going to be seven times six times five times four, etc. It's gonna be seven times, skip six because six is even, so times five, times, skip four because four is even, times three, skip two because two is even, times one. That's the double factorial of seven, which of course turns out to be 105, if I've done my math right. So then you can probably guess what, for example, eight double factorial would be. Same idea, except this time we're going to skip the odds because eight itself is an even number. So we would have eight times, skip seven because seven is odd, six times, skip five because five is odd, four times, skip three because three is odd, Odd, times two, and we actually just stop there. Of course, you could include the times one if you want, but you know, it doesn't make any difference. And this happens to equal 384, I believe, although let me double check. Yes, that's correct. So those are two examples of the double factorial. You could probably bang out several others yourself. Hopefully it makes sense how the double factorial is defined. You just take a positive, positive integer and it works just like the normal factorial, except you'll skip the numbers that don't share 
parity with the original number. Since seven is odd, we just have the odds here. Since eight is even, we just have the evens. And you may be wondering about this. For zero, the double factorial is once again defined to equal one. It's called an empty product. All right, now defining new notations is fun and all. You know, it's a little silly, you get a little wacky. Everybody loves it. But it's a little less interesting without seeing an example of where it would actually show up in some sort of mathematical problem. So for a great example of that, let's look at graph theory. Graph theory is a field of math studying things called graphs. And as every graph theorist says when they introduce this, we're not talking about X, Y, plane graphs. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about nodes and edges, or to use the language that I more commonly use, vertices and edges. So a graph is a structure which consists of vertices. Here are three vertices. Or maybe I'll do four vertices. It has vertices and it has edges between them, like an edge between those guys. And perhaps the other vertices in this graph don't have any edges. So this could be just an example of a graph. It has four vertices and there's one edge that joins two of the vertices. This could, for example, represent a group of four people. And if two of the people are friends, then they're joined by an edge. So in this graph, we would see that none of the people are friends except person two and person four. One of the nice things about graph theory is that graphs can be pretty easy to draw, and you can learn a lot by drawing them and considering how they could be drawn. But keep in mind that how they're drawn isn't particularly important most of the time. The structure of the graph is what's important. So I could draw this graph a totally different way and have it still be the same graph. Let's say I do that over here in a different color just to drive this point home. I could have the vertex four over here and the vertex one over here and the vertex three over here and the vertex two over here. Now to match this graph structurally, all I need to do is make sure that two and four are joined by an edge and I could do that however I want. Maybe I do it in a really stupid way like that. The graphs look different, but structurally they are the same, and that's what's important. Anyhow, let's come back to this nice uh, black graph that's drawn a little more nicely. There are several edges that this graph could have that it doesn't. For example, one and two are not joined by an edge. They could be, but they're not. Two and three are not joined by an edge. We say that they are not adjacent, whereas two and four are adjacent. Two and three aren't adjacent, but they could be. Let's say we make them adjacent. And maybe three and four, we also join those. Maybe one and four, we join those. And one and two, we join those. And one and three, let's join those as well. And now, hey, look, this graph suddenly has every edge it possibly could. A graph that has every edge possible on its set of vertices is called a complete graph. That, of course, is because it has a complete set of edges. It has every edge that it possibly could. Now, the only other thing you need to understand before we see where the double factorial comes in is this idea of something called a matching. Before I sketch out another example for that, we might say that this edge joining one and three matches the vertex one to the vertex three. Because each edge is incident with two vertices, we can view each edge as matching one vertex to another. Here's a cute graph on three vertices, where the vertex A is joined to the vertex B with an edge. And so we could say that this edge matches the vertex A to the vertex B. And I could view this edge as a sort of matching on this graph. But it's not a particularly nice matching because the vertex C is left all alone. It hasn't been matched to anybody. I could add an edge here joining A and C, but it's still only going to have A either matched to B if we pick this edge, or if we pick this edge, we could have A matched to C. Either way, a vertex is left on its own, and we can't match A to two vertices at once. It can be adjacent to two vertices at once, sure, but if we're talking about matchings, which is a slightly different concept, we can't match A to multiple vertices. I could take this edge, which leaves C all alone, or I could take this edge, which leaves B all alone. 
If I want every vertex to get matched up with a partner, well that would only be possible in a graph that has an even number of vertices, like this graph that has four vertices. In this graph, I could match A with C, and I could match B with D. That would be what we call a perfect matching, because every vertex is covered by some edge. There are other possibilities too. I could match A with B and C with D. Or we could match A with D and C with B. There are several possibilities. And perhaps I'll sketch those out using different colors. That's one possible perfect matching of this graph. Here's another possible perfect matching of the graph. And here is the last perfect matching of the graph. Now I should clarify, this graph can only have all of these three perfect matchings if it indeed has all of these edges. If the graph didn't have these black edges, for example, maybe it just has the orange ones, so A is adjacent to C and B is adjacent to D, well then it doesn't matter that A could be adjacent to B, A is not adjacent to B. This graph only has one perfect matching, which consists of this edge and this edge. The other edges that could exist for perfect matchings just don't exist in this graph. But if we have a complete graph like this guy here, which has all of the edges, you see we have several possibilities for perfect matchings. But also, that's only possible if we have an even number of vertices, like in this case we have four. If you have five vertices, or seven vertices, or nine vertices, no matter how you try to match things together, there's always going to be at least one vertex left out. So then that leads to our question, which is, how many perfect matchings does a complete graph on, let's say, n vertices have, where, of course, n has to be even for it to have any perfect matchings at all. We saw that in the case of four vertices, there were three different perfect matchings, but what about larger even values of n? This, by the way, is the notation for a complete graph on n vertices. It's a k with a subscript of n. So that's our question. How many perfect matchings does kn have? And we're just considering n being even, because otherwise the answer is zero perfect matchings. Well, let me sketch out a little hypothetical graph here, and you'll see that this question is actually pretty easy to answer. And we'll see our friend, the double factorial, when we solve this problem. So we don't know how many vertices our graph has. Let's just say it goes on in this way, A, B, C, D, E, and so on. It's got a bunch of vertices. We don't know how many, but some even number. Now we're assuming this is a complete graph, so every possible edge is available to us when constructing a matching. Now let's see how many choices we have when we construct a perfect matching of this hypothetical graph. And again, remember, we're just going to say that this graph has n vertices. So if we're going to construct a perfect matching, every vertex needs to get matched up with some other vertex. So we could just arbitrarily pick our first vertex to match. Let's say we start with A, and we're going to match A to some other vertex. Now, how many vertices do we have to choose from that we could match A to? Well, there's n vertices total. We can't match A to itself. So that leaves n minus one choices. So let's jot that down over here, n minus one. Now just for our picture, let's say we decide to match a to the vertex d. Now two vertices have been matched together, and so n minus two vertices remain. We'd have to arbitrarily pick one to match next. Let's say we pick b. So we have n minus two vertices left, we're picking B, that's what we're going to match with something else. How many choices do we have of what vertex to match B with? Well, there were N vertices total, but we can't match B with itself or with A or D because those have been matched together already. So we have exactly N minus three choices left. So let's say we match B to some other hypothetical vertex. I'll just represent it like that and then we would continue in this manner. You can see at each step we're knocking out 
two vertices from our possible choices, since we match vertices two at a time. This pattern would continue, n minus one, n minus three, times n minus five, and so on, until we only have a single choice left. But then what we're looking at here is actually n minus one double factorial. For example, imagine n was eight, then this here would be eight minus one, which is seven, times eight minus three, which is five, times eight minus five, which is three, times one. 7 times 5 times 3 times 1. That would be a double factorial. Notice how the thing being subtracted from n is going up 2 in each term. So the parity isn't going to change. In this situation, the first number is odd, and all of the other numbers will be odd as well, because they're just going down 2 at each step. So how many perfect matchings does the complete graph kn have if n is even? Well, the answer is n minus one double factorial. So that's what the double factorial is. And that's an example of it being the solution to a mathematical problem. I'll leave links in the description to other videos going over these graph theory concepts if you find it interesting. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.